the innovation economy, the knowledge economy, whatever you call it, it's very likely the future economy. And while Canadians are eagerly jumping into high innovation sectors, information technology, advanced manufacturing and the like, there are indications that we're not getting the most out of our efforts, in particular because we're not tending to our intellectual property. Joining us now to dig into this, Dan Bresnitz. He is Chair of Innovation Studies and the Co-Director of the Innovation Policy Lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs at U of T. Giuseppina D'Agostino, Founder and Director of the Intellectual Property Law and Technology Program at the Osgoode Hall Law School. And Dan Churiak, Senior Fellow at CG, the Center for International Governance Innovation and former Deputy Chief Economist for Canada's Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade. And it's great to have you three here with us at TVO tonight to talk about something. And Dan, I'm going to you first. I guess I should say both names because we've got two Dans here. Dan Bresnitz. Uh, this is something that we need to know a lot about. And I suspect most people watching us right now don't even know what intellectual property is. So let's get a definition off the top before we start. Sure, it's the ability to actually own your innovation. So you invented something, it's knowledge. If you don't own it, anyone can copycat it. We probably heard stories about Chinese copycats before that was Japanese, Korean. Um, if you own it, you can actually get to be paid on it. So if you innovate and you want to make money and you want to create jobs, you actually have to have ownership. Okay, you said recently in a piece in the Globe and Mail that I read of yours, Canadians operate in a world where the deck of cards is already dealt and our competitors have all the aces. Which means what? For example, um, you might heard that Google is going to do a smart city in Toronto. Yes. You might also heard their former CEO and chairman thanking Canada. And the reason he thanked Canada is that all the intellectual property owned by Google, on which they make their money, was actually based on research by Canadian in Canada, paid for by the Canadian taxpayers. But they own it. Yeah. So we did it and they're getting rich off it. More or less, yeah. Fun, yeah. isn't it? You say that like it's a negative thing. Yeah, I also think Google should earn more money because they just don't <laughs> have enough. <laughs> okay, let's take a look at some figures here. You can look at the monitors here in the studio. This is according to the World Intellectual Property Association. We are not doing too well on this list. Here are some of the more innovative countries in the world. Switzerland, Sweden, the US, UK, Finland. Now we're getting lower. France, Israel. We are number 18 on this list. Uh, if you keep going down, one country likely to be a major player. Yes, China. 22 today, uh, but we can assume going to go higher up the list as we go along. Now, Let's do a second graphic here. The same organization has also computed the location of innovation hotspots, mapping places where most patents originate, and it calculated that more than half of the leading inventors live and work in only 30 hotspots across the globe. And unfortunately, you will notice something missing from that list, everybody. No dots for Canada. No dots for Canada. Knowledge-based technologies are based on ideas, and for these ideas to become economically effective, they need to first become patents. So let's do one more graphic here and show you how Canada ranks in patent applications in comparison with other countries. This is patents per million. And there are South Korea, Japan, Switzerland, well at the top of the list. US, Germany, China, Finland. And there we are, well, well down that list. We're number 19 on that list. Uh, okay, Pina, come on in here and tell us about all of these numbers that we've just seen. Mm -hmm. What do they tell us about Canada's place in the world of innovation? Well, I can tell you we have the talent, so that's not the problem. There is no lack of talent in this country. I see it in myself when my students, they have the smarts and the enthusiasm to change the world and to make it a better place. What we do lack are, is the infrastructure and the ecosystem. So a lot of those figures show, I think, one particular slice of the innovation economy, and that's looking at patents. That's a, a sort of in some ways a narrow view, because patents is one part of the whole ecosystem. It's the resources that have to be in place, the infrastructure. So for instance, at the university, the tech transfer offices, they're at the very gate when the students want, and they come up with their little brilliant idea, and they want to commercialize that, then they need the resources in place, the personnel, who need to be able to assist the student or that entrepreneur to get that startup to market. So if it's a pie, patents are one slice of the pie. One slice are they the of biggest the pie. slice of the pie? It's 
It's a necessary part of the, the pie, mm -hmm. but it's one part of it. I wouldn't say it's the biggest, but it's the bedrock of it. And the so other I, slices, uh, I mean, if we're going to torture yeah, this metaphor a little yeah. more, the other slices, <laughs> well, you talked about the infrastructure. Right. That would include what other kinds of things? So the money to money. also money, mm -hmm. which is something that I see happen where students go south. So they go to the valley where the money, there's more money. Silicon Valley. Yeah, in, in Silicon Valley. So you I guys call it the yeah, valley. Okay. The valley. Well, right. I spent a year there. I spent a year at Stanford, and I saw students there working with Y Combinator, which is a, a brand name there for tech startups. And there, you know, Airbnb, Reddit, um, the, they made these big companies there. And so our students go down there. It's the same talent, the same technology, but they get the money quicker and faster. Okay, we're going to explore how we can do better on all of these things here. Dan Churia, can you explain, uh, talk to us about the economic impact on a country that lags behind when it comes to the development of intellectual property. Okay, so think about the traditional economy first, which is based upon machinery and equipment, physical capital. Think of an economy that doesn't have that kind of capital. Talking Africa. Talk about an economy that has lots of that capital, the United States. That's the importance of having the fundamental essential capital of the uh, economy of your age. Now for the knowledge-based economy, as, as, as Pina and, and Dan have been pointing out, intellectual property is the essential capital. So if you don't have that capital stock, you don't build companies on it, you don't have market share in that world, and that's why we're lagging. Now, think even forward. The, uh, uh, the, the uh, variable that is showing hockey stick growth now is data. And for the data-driven economy, in the, which is the future, and this is gonna be the internet of things, it's Google, it's Facebook, data is the essential capital stock, and it's who captures that data and monetizes it that will dominate the world. If you don't have the data stocks, you will not have market share. The economy that he just described earlier, the machinery and service of goods and that type of thing, does that economy, the industrial economy, if I can put it that way, does that work differently than the knowledge-based economy? Oh, no longer. So for example, you're a farmer and you own, you think you own a John Deere tractor. Back in the good old days, you actually owned the tractor, and you can fix it, you can do whatever you want with it. In the new knowledge economy, what John Deere is claiming, that they own the tractor, and they own all the data from the tractor. Another company claims that they own your seeds, right? Because it's genetically modified. So in the end, you, the farmer, right, the bedrock of Canada, is actually an employee, soon to be very badly paid employee, of John Deere and the seed companies who own the knowledge and the data. They become rich, and you become an employee. Marginalized. <laughs> Marginalized. Yeah. Really? So not even, never mind, you don't, they become rich, you become well off? Uh, no. Not even. If you look at the US and you look at farmers, uh, from chicken farmers to corn farmers to anything that those companies now control, you become a badly paid employee. Hmm. Think about, think about the, the, the gap in pay between the C-suite and the shop floor. It's getting wider and wider, and you become the guy on the shop floor. So, if, Pina, it, obviously not enough to just develop intellectual properties, equally, if not more important, to keep them here. That's right. So how do we, you want to give us some hints about how we can get oh, that done? Wow. Well, I'm, I'm trying to do it myself through the innovation clinic. So I, I talked a bit about some of the problems. So you do need the patents the IP and so with patents come all the other associated IP rights. But then you also need that ecosystem and what we're lacking is that culture of innovation in Canada. In many ways, um, when we look to other countries or when I go back to my time in the Valley, mm. you saw that there, the students, they go to law school, they wanna make millions, they wanna be the next Facebook. When students go to law school here, they want to go work in a law firm or make policy or other options, but they don't really come uh, to law school to, to make that big company. So I think there needs to be a cultural shift and that's something that takes time. Um, that's something more on the ground, um, but what also needs to happen is that we need to have, and finally now with budget 2017, there was a f pronouncement. We're gonna get to that. Yeah, we're gonna get to that in a second, but let yeah. me go back to the cultural thing here. Uh, Dan Churiak, that sounds like a 25 year project. To get, to get young people to stop thinking about becoming lawyers and doing contract law and actually go out and 
found the next Facebook. Well, it, it very well could be. You sh a, a shorter graphic with lots of hotspots, okay? And the reason why there are hotspots is because people who want to do innovation cluster with each other. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, there's a big first mover advantage to those hotspots that are established because there's lots of smart people, lots of entrepreneurial people already there. Yeah. And when, when you do innovation, you're connecting dots as it were. So if you've got one smart idea here, another smart idea here, these connect to make a new one. And that's how uh, innovation happens. So to create that, that dense of entrepreneurial activity in Canada from a very low base, it, it will be a generation's worth. Let's do a, a few examples here of the phenomenon that we're talking about. Other Dan, over here, uh, we just recently saw Bombardier has, um, they got a great plane, but they've lost the opportunity to sell it because of the whole tariff thing it's involved in with the U.S. right now. So they've sold it off to Airbus in order to make that deal. I mean, is that an example of that's, us coming up with something and somebody else getting rich off it? That's one example. I just want to go back to culture yeah. and give some hope. <laughs> so as I was doing my research on Israel, what I found fascinating is report after report of what was then called the Office of Chief Scientist, which is what Israel has and we don't, and that's an innovation agency, meaning a government minister with a budget which is set, not just year by year, and its sole purpose is to do innovation policy, not research policy, not education policy, innovation policy. And reports after reports claiming that the Israelis are just not innovative. None of them wants to be an entrepreneur. All of them want to work for companies. Even with all the opportunities in government health, they just don't do it. Uh, and they don't know what to do. And look what happens in Israel now, leading the world with startups. It's called the Startup Nation now. Startup yeah. Nation. Um, what I will say uh, that we have been doing a lot of innovation and constantly lose them. So if you have a mobile phone, I think I saw a mobile phone, a multi-touch technology developed in the University of Toronto, now owned by someone else. Um, I would also say, and it, it's great that you mentioned our big companies, our problem is not just entrepreneurship. You look at across the private sector in Canada, and apart from one or two companies, we do not innovate. So if you look back to your maps, it's not just Silicon Valley, it's also Germany. And in Germany, it's not the startups, it's the big companies, because they understand that if they want to survive, they have to innovate. Canadian companies, many of them, apart from one you mentioned and one more, basically seem not to understand. What's the other one? Toys R Us and yeah. Sears, they're struggling, right? Yeah. Toys R Us yep. and Sears are struggling. And Amazon is disrupting that market. So in Amazon uh, is disrupting their market yeah. and has disrupted many others yeah, and will exactly. disrupt them more. Yeah. So if you don't innovate in services, yeah. in business, in retail, in manufacturing, you will not stay. Pina, you want to give us an example of a company that uh, was homegrown, made in Canada, came up with something great, and then it's creating revenue for someone else now because we lost it. Oh, gosh, there's, there's quite a few of them. Um, I got a Blackberry in my pocket. Maybe that's one of them? I think so. Yeah. I think so. And uh, Maluba, for Maluba, example. Yeah. Is What's that? Maluba, which is the uh, artificial yeah. intelligence company, which was yeah. uh, developed in Canada and was bought out by Microsoft and has been repatriated to, uh, I think, Redmond. Hmm. It's in Washington now. I believe so. Or the key personnel. But mm -hmm. let me uh, go back to this issue of Bombardier in the C series. Mm -hmm. So, the United States, um, or the White House at least, is keen on repatriating old industrial activity. And when the and yes, the Bombardier C series will apparently find a new uh, home in Sweet Home Alabama, but that's that will be the production of it. The the key part of it, the intellectual part, which uh, the development of, of this better plane uh, actually will, will hopefully stay in Canada. So Bombardier survives by, by, by hiving off the actual physical production. So here's a, a, a difference in strategy. We are actually, I think, in this particular case, retaining the, uh, the, the key innovative part and allowing for, to, to preserve the, the uh, viability of, of, of the product, we are we're allowing the, the physical production to go down to the States. But surely that's the second best option. I mean, the it's, best option would have been to have it all here. The best option right. would have been not to have the tariffs, yes. Yes, not to have the tariffs in the first place. Okay, let's get, uh, Pina, you raised the issue of the um, federal budget last year, mm -hmm. which for the first time, intellectual property is actually sort of right there baked into the budget yeah. plan. 
Uh, okay, when you saw that, what did you think? Well, hallelujah. <laughs> So many throne speeches and uh, just budgets passed me by. I wasn't taking out the popcorn uh, watching them. Um, for Especially for an IP scholar, you'd want to see that vision at the very top, which has been lacking for so many years. So what does it suggest to you? So it suggests that finally the government is getting it and that finally perhaps we're going to all start to you know, come up with that hymn book and start singing the same tune. Because uh, I think also, I worked in Ottawa for a bit, and there, there are many different departments that all deal with IP, frankly, and they just don't realize it. So you usually have the usual suspect uh, shops in Ottawa that deal with IP, and I think it needs to be more pervasive across Ottawa, not have a siloed approach. So I think with a, a vision from the very top, is what we need. But then, backing that vision, the resources need to come. Mm -hmm. So like what you suggested, Dan, with Israel, how year and year after year, Israel commits money to this. this it can't just be a one-off now and not have, some, uh, not have a sustainable strategy going forward. It's too important for it not to be the case. So they get it, Dan. They get, in principle, that IP is now on the agenda, if I can use that expression. Mm -hmm. What specifically did they do? Uh, this, well, in terms of the, the clustering initiative, right, they are actually pouring money into clusters. The question is, are, is there a sufficient scale there? If you think about, for example, what an Elon Musk will be putting you know, in, into one of his projects, the amount of money that we're putting into clusters yeah. across Canada pales by comparison. Well, I know, we got 950 million bucks. That's, is that chicken feed? But the other thing uh, with the yes. cluster... It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. So it let, is. let, let yeah. me be very, it is. very, very clear, okay? If you remember budgets by budget of this government, uh, we had the cluster from the beginning. We just didn't have super. They were called clusters. And they have 800 instead of 950. Now, divide 950 by five, then put it all across Canada. It's chicken feed. It is feed. chicken feed. I'm sorry. Yeah. So That's, they get it, but they didn't get it enough. I would, I would go further, with all due respect to our beloved government. I actually think I said, and Minister Baines gets it. This is Navdeep Baines, who yes. is the minister in charge. And I think he hired really good people on the IP and others. Yeah. However, I look at the Ministry of Finance and our beloved Prime Minister, and I don't see them giving them any new resources. What I see is a lot of talk, but I look at the budget and working in public policy I believe it only when you give resources you're serious about something yeah. as a politician. I don't see a transfer of budget. Dan Churiak, they've got advanced manufacturing that they're going to fund, agri-food, clean tech, digital technology, health biosciences, clean resources, infrastructure, transportation. Sounds like a pretty good list. The list is correct. It's yes. a question of the scale of, of the money that you're putting in. But let me uh, uh, flip back to the question of data. Mm -hmm. We are signing on in, to international treaties where we agree that data should be able to uh, flow freely um, across borders with no data localization. Now, so go back to, to uh, Dan's John Deere tractor. It means that the data generated in Canada should flow freely across borders to whoever can capture that and is not, uh, uh, is not retained in Canada, is not capitalized in Canada, is not monetized in Canada. Now, if we were to go back 100 years and were to say, well, you know, we should have a free flow of oil across borders and anyone should be able to come in here and take the oil royalty free, uh, uh, that wouldn't sound like and such a good fly. idea. No. But I'm not saying that we should put a tax on, on, on data or, or, or try to, 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 to uh, uh, charge for it because Canadians get benefits from being able to use Google, right? Mm -hmm. And from, from using Facebook. Mm -hmm. But the issue across the board when we talk about smart houses, smart cars, um, the uh, smart tractors is who captures that data and if, if Canada does not capture its fair share of it, we will not have a foothold in the future data-driven economy and that is going to dominate. Right now... Uh, so that uh, comes down to the IP, right? That, the IP is the bedrock to it. So going back it, to also the super clusters, AI yeah. is one of them. What Ar might, artificial intelligence. Yeah, 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 artificial intelligence. So what might be encouraging is that the government has mandated that they all have an IP strategy. So, okay, finally, right? So that's good. That's good. Like that. but that's only 50 what, years too yeah. late, but yeah. <laughs> no, but what also might be problematic, or at least it gives me um, a sense of pause, is when I see the number of partners that these super clusters are bringing in. While I'm all about inclusivity and cooperation, more collaboration, 
70, 80 partners, some of them have upwards of hundreds. How do you figure out the IP there? Presumably, they're bringing in IP to generate more IP. Who's going to own it? Hmm. So they need to be very clear from the get-go. Or We don't want uh, now a mech of litigation coming out of these super hmm. clusters, right? So I Can think I just bring it back to the money, though, for a second? Yeah. If, if not, I mean, it's almost a billion dollars, admittedly. Divided by regions, mm -hmm. divided by sectors. Okay, so it's not that much money you suggest at the end of the day. If they were really serious about it, what kind of nut are we looking at? A way bigger nut, a walnut at least. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let me give you. Let, let, let's talk ballparks. That okay? was good. <laughs> it's funny. Um, and let's. I'm just using Israel again because people have been constantly harping on Israel. Um, the Israeli innovation agency have more or less half a billion a year to support its activities. And every year it goes slightly up. It's There's in a no country of uh, 9 million people? It's Toronto. It's in a country yeah. the size of Toronto. Yeah. Six Greater million. Toronto, if you want to feel better. Five and a half, six Toronto. million people. Right. OK. Um, they have half a billion. And this is just one government agency. Um, so now let's divide it to Canada. We should start at least by three billion, probably more. We are also a very big country. Mm -hmm. We actually have much more potential from Israel because we're a very big country. Can I challenge that a bit, Dan? I'm just wondering, because the Israeli military mm -hmm. is so ingrained into every aspect of society, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the innovation and high tech possibilities in Israel encouraged by the military, which we, I mean, we just don't have that kind of thing here. The military is not as singular a feature in Canada as it is clearly mm -hmm. in Israel. Uh, we're, we're in different neighborhoods. Does that give, in some odd kind of way, Israel an advantage, a, a, an imperative, if you like, to go more in on this? I would say it gives an imperative. Yes. And it has been giving an imperative for many years. However, that imperative for many years was not used. So what is interesting about many of the figures that you showed, but if you look at Israel, just at the time that they decided to have an innovation agenda, they look just like Canada. Almost all the figures were, that's exactly where Israel was. Huh. And within 20 years, we're now number one on many things. Hmm. Uh, the military was always there. So the question is not what resources you have. We have wonderful agro uh, technology, wonderful um, you want to call it extractive in mining and oil technologies, mm -hmm. do we use them to become an innovation economy or not? Right now, we don't. But it's a pretty good start, it's wouldn't, wouldn't you say? pretty good start. So if you look at AI, at least, they're, they've also committed $30 million to the Vector Institute mm -hmm. here in Ontario, $125 million for AI generally, federally. So I think if we try and organize the super clusters and have other monies coming in through other initiatives, maybe that's the way to go. Hmm. Yeah. But, in, in, in terms of the, the rationale for government engagement, there has to be some sort of a, a market failure, as it were, right? Uh, the market is not filling in the gaps. And Canada has got very weak venture capital. Israel probably has got the best access to venture capital in the world. Thanks to the government. Thanks, thanks to the government, After but also private. Uh, you, you, there was nothing, nothing in Israel until the government tried once, tried twice, twice. tried thrice until they succeed. But there's a, different, there's a different attitude to these kinds of things in Israel. In, in Israel, I mean, I've, yeah. it's been many years since I've been there, but I remember talking to high-tech people the last yeah. time I was there, and they said, we encourage failure here. Yeah. We yeah. love it when people try and fail and fail and fail and fail again, because they learn stuff and eventually they'll succeed. That's right. In Canada, we abhor failure all the time Absolutely. under any circumstances, and we shame people who do it. Surely, we put the tail between our legs and run <laughs> off, and that's the end of the startup. This is Whereas, what I mean by cultural differences. Yeah, and going back to the valley, too, there, they're seen as experiences. The more failures you have, they're badges of honor that you've been there in the trenches. Not here. Not so here. So how do we change that cultural? It goes back to that initial conversation that we had, right? We need to, and it, it's what we said, might maybe 25 years to do it. Mm. But I think we need to start, and I also animating all of that, it goes back to the IP and having awareness. So hopefully now, at the very start, we have the government saying IP is important, we're putting money behind it, and on the ground, they also need to be mindful of what's going on. And there, I have to say, through my own work, I haven't been happy with what I've been seeing. Mm. Yeah. So I would also say that we have to be smart. 
as I said, all the ACEs are already owned. Even if we now start to produce IP like there's no tomorrow, we'll still not produce as much IP as China, as the US. So what we should do, and what we are really good at, because we're Canadian, people trust us, is changing the rules of the game. So through the Standard Council of Canada, uh, through other organization in Ottawa, we can actually start to have an international voice about how you govern IP. And we have to, because for the next 25 years, even if all my students will start to do patents once a week, we still will not have enough IP. We need to figure out how we change the game, yeah. not just how we change how much money we have in the bank. In which case, you've mentioned Israel a, a few times here tonight. Dan, what other country around the world should we try to, I don't know about copy, but at least learn some lessons from? I would look at Germany. Uh, Germany has got an interesting uh, approach to innovation. They don't actually have uh, the government uh, support for it in the sense of R&D tax credits. Uh, what Germany has got is a lot of government, uh, quasi-government co-investment. And I think that's, a, uh, that's an approach which is viable for Canada, especially in view of uh, the possibility of having uh, 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 tariffs being put up on Canadian products if they are subsidized, seem to be mm -hmm. subsidized by the government. So I think we have to have a stronger public labs sector um, and stronger government en engagement in products which the private sector may not find attractive but which actually make, uh, make sense from a long-term perspective. The C-Series is actually a good example of that. It almost broke the bank for Bombardier, yet it is a better plane. Good technology can be hard to produce and may stretch the capabilities of the private sector. That's exactly where the public sector should be going. So I would focus on co-investment. I would focus on, on uh, developing the kinds of products which are uh, uh, pre-competitive, as it were, uh, and Canada can do that, and Canada has had a good track record in that area, and it's very much like the German model. A lot of talk about Israel, a lot of talk now about Germany. Uh, China. Fin China, well, China. Finland? Finland, I would say Finland and China for two very different reasons. Go ahead. So first of all, Finland is a big northern country, uh, which don't have a lot of population. Small northern country. Um, look mm -hmm. at the map. It's small <laughs> compared to Canada, but remember, yeah. we like to think of ourselves as small. So we have to decide, are we small, are we oh, okay. big, okay. are we in the middle? Every conversation, we claim we're something else. <laughs> um, Finland, uh, very small population, very cold, a lot of commodities. Uh, one of our leaders once quipped that Finland should never export anything which is smaller than an elephant. And within seven years, they had Nokia, which, uh, like Blackberries, like other, for a while, roll the waves in terms of mobile technology. They now have more startup ups than almost any other country in the world. Finland has more yep. startups than almost any country in the world. It's still Israel. Though, uh, in it? terms of population. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, per, per, per capita. Per capita, okay. yeah. Um, do you play any games on your mobile phone when you don't No, interviews? I work all the time. I know. So when you work all the time <laughs> on figure out that new technology on your phone, <laughs> you are helping the Finnish economy because most of the games you play, the most popular games, almost all of them come from Finland, for example, huh. from Helsinki. Um, Again, government intervention. Again, by the way, not alone. In consultation with the unions and the workers and the employers, figuring out that this is the future of a country. What I will say that we need to learn about China is China understood IP, also understood that it's very weak on IP. So they did few things. First, they educated everybody. And when I mean everybody, I mean everybody. There's a high school leaving cert in which you ask question about IP. Hmm. Uh, they also then went to all the international bodies and started populating them with Chinese. They then also went to all the Chinese companies, educated them and on IP and helped them going to those international forums, knowing that what they really want to achieve is a lowering of the price of IP. So your metaphor about oil, yes, it would be nice uh, if people pay or not pay about data, right? But it's much more interesting if we can cho choose what kind of prices we pay, whether we know we own the oil or we know the technology of how to take the oil out of the ground, right? And that's where we need to play. I remember earlier in the program, we put up that list of patents per capita, and Canada was well down the list. Mm. Let me ask you, how expensive is it to try and patent something Gosh. in Canada? 
$20,000 at least, upwards of that. So the costs are prohibitive. And when you think about the students, so when we go back to really on the, on the ground, where are these inventions taking place? Really, the universities are one of the, the greatest hubs of it. And so here you have students that are already trying to pay down their debts for getting themselves through school. They have this invention. How can they afford $20,000 to start up their company? They can't. So that's prohibitive to start with. It's prohibitive to start with. And that tends to already there from the gate stifle innovation. Mm -hmm. Let me read you this quote here from the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, where they say 83% of Canadian small and medium enterprises report that, quote, IP was not relevant to their business when citing the reasons for not seeking IP it rights. It drives me nuts when well, what, I hear that. It drives you, me nuts. What do you infer from that? Well, I infer that they don't get that they have IP to, that, to begin with. And that's something that I deal with all the time. If you believe it, even in Stanford, I was there leading Companies, these startups, didn't even want to hear about the word IP. Because whenever you think about IP, they see it as a barrier. Oh, that's going to cost me, or that's trouble. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, they should see it as an enabler of change, an enabler to help their company. Because next thing you know, they're going to be slapped with a lawsuit if they don't think about it early on, mm -hmm. right? So I usually get into uh, arguments or really try and voice my concerns about their approach when they don't think about the IP. It has to be thought of. The IP lawyers have to be there at the table with the business, with the invention, with the scientists, all of them together at the beginning. Yeah. Let me give you an example. Hmm. A, from China. Uh, remember DVDs? Sure. So Chinese actually produced most of the DVDs in the world. But as they were producing them and producing them and producing them, what they found out that they're paying more and more and more as the price of a DVD went down to the people who own the IP. So at some point, they thought IP is not, none of our business. They just produce plastic DVDs, right? They found out that it is because they weren't. There wasn't a lawsuit. But in order to produce a DVD, they had to pay for the owners of a DVD technology. And at some point, that payment was more than their profit. So those small Canadian companies think that IP is not part of the game until they will sit down and look at their cost and will figure out that they pay more for IP than they pay for metal, plastic, or wood. Hmm. So Let where... Me, uh, all right, go ahead, Dan. Sure. If I may jump in, Steve. So in terms of the share, okay, there's a statistic which is really striking, and that is the percentage of the market capitalization of the S&P 500 in the United States, which is attributed to intangible capital. In the 1970s, it was down around 17.5%. At less than the 80-20 rule, it, was, it could be ignored. Today, it's around 90%. How much? 90%. And that is, of course, it's trademarks, it's goodwill, and those kinds of things. But much of it is, uh, is IP, uh, in, in intellectual property. And a large and growing part is data. And that, so if you think about, can you ignore it? Well, if it's the largest part of your capital stock of the future economy, you cannot ignore it. So yes. What was we that expression in you use? Intangible capital? Is that what intangible you're capital? Meaning yes. what? It means it's not the you've got replacement cost capital. Okay, so it's the machinery in, in your equipment. You you spend some money to put it in there. You depreciate it. On top of that, the market then puts a capital value on your company, which is way larger, and that is the intangible capital. And that is huge, 90% now of the S&P 500. And, and I would also say that trademarks are actually intellectual capital. Oh, of course. Yeah. We need to, uh, people think that intellectual capital yeah. is patent. No, intellectual capital is trademarks, trade secrets, copyrights, patents, standards. The know-how. Knowledge. Yeah. All the things that you can actually use in order to make yeah. money and make your products. Hmm. Yeah. In our last couple of minutes here, then, let's throw some ideas out here. You want people to see that IP, in some respects, needs yeah. a seat at the table. It's got to right. be right up there at the top. Absolutely. How are you going to get people to realize that? Well, I'm starting from the grassroots. So the Innovation Clinic is something I want to talk about, where there I have the law students who are paired up with entrepreneurs and inventors. So at the Lausanne School of Engineering, we work, we get referrals from Innovation York. Also, CG just partnered with us. And what we're trying to do is have students help these inventors start up their companies. And so what we do is, we talked about $20,000 prohibitive mm -hmm. costs. We're going to cut those costs because the students do the work for free. And there's Norton Rose, a supervising law firm, which is able to oversee all of this work. 
and give these companies a chance, these students a chance to start up. And they're doing really well, actually. There's already paying bills, many of these companies. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them has more than 50 employees. They're winning competitions. For wh what's that one about? Oh, there. Are you allowed to say yeah, what the product is? I can or? say what the product yeah. is. One is um, dealing with freeze drying uh, food. So trying to tackle the big problem of global hunger to the problem in our homes of food wastage. Right. So that's one of them. Another one actually which is really cool is uh, looking at um, um, workaround issues in building, um, in construction sites. So you figure out that there's a problem before you, you know, cut the ribbon. And so this is using technology, augmented reality, to figure that out. And these are all students at York that figured this out. Hmm. Okay. Uh, you know what? I suspect that anybody still watching us who may not have known very much about all of this at the beginning of the hour, they're experts now because you guys were great. You really explained this in a fantastic way. So, uh, Mr. Director, can we thank Dan Churiak, Senior Fellow at the Center for International Governance Innovation. That's CG. He's a former Deputy Chief Economist at the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade. And there on the other side of the table, Giuseppina D'Agostino, Founder and Director of the Intellectual Property Law and Technology Program at the Osgoode Hall Law School and Dan Bresnitz, Chair of Innovation Studies and the co-director of the Innovation Policy Lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs at the U of T. Thanks to the three of you for joining Thank us here at TVO you. tonight. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Very much. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.